Hello, it's fantastic to have you all here today. I'm Ivan Novotny, your moderator for this afternoon session. I'm a researcher at the Forest Management and Development Group of ETH Zurich. My work involves agroecology, food security, human environment interaction, and the influence of policies on agricultural systems. This morning, we heard great speakers discussing the challenges we face to make agrobiodiversity more prominent. We saw global level comparisons between agrobiodiverse systems and conventional monocropping systems. We also saw the relation between socioeconomic factors and the adoption of agroecological practices. For this session, we are going to focus on the relation of indigenous people have with neglected and underutilized species. As you may know, indigenous people usually carry the torch of culturally and nutritionally relevant agricultural systems. Sadly, they are the most of the time facing challenges that threaten their key role in conserving agrobiodiversity. In this context, I would like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Francisco Rosado, who is a professor at the Universidad Intercultural Maya de Quintana Roo, located in Mexico. Francisco has ample experience in several American, European, African, and Asian countries. Francisco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ivan. I'm already started to uh, share my slides. Here they are. And uh, let's start with this brief history of knowledge systems related to food production. 10,000 years ago, we started with agricultural uh, systems based on indigenous knowledge systems. There was no other way to do that. It was indigenous people starting it. And 40 years ago, agroecology began. 76 years ago, the Green Revolution began. Nothing of these two um, systems, agroecology or Green Revolution, uh, are, are compared to the 10,000 years of experience that indigenous people have already accumulated. And in the case of the Yucatec Maya, in the Yucatan, we can observe, we can notice these cycles going on um, in their food system. Let's think of starting with natural vegetation. Then there is a soil preparation, there's the first station, there's planting, then there is design and management of different food systems until they achieve a full established and, system and working food system. Then in, the, in recent years, that food system, that traditional food system is substituted by green revolution techniques from multi-cropping to monocropping. And to many of them, to many of them, the, the late result, the ultimate result is the abandonment because of pollution, loss of productivity, death, etc. But let's take a look in pictures of what's going on. This is the natural forest, the forestation, planting, uh, milpa grows and other systems. And they get a point in which there is a very diverse subsystem in their food system. This is very interesting. And I'm gonna go into more details, uh, but many of them move to conventional techniques. They start incorporating uh, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, etc. And to about 50% of them, this is the end result, erosion. But let's focus at the point in which uh, there is a great diversity of systems, beekeeping, milpa, livestock, li livestock, in agro silvo pastoral system, cows, goats, forest use and management, home garden, with uh, many uh, diversities of crops and other subsystems within this other subsystem, within the home garden subsystem. So the Yucatec Maya farmers developed a complex set of subsystems for food production and livelihood, ecologically, culturally, and socially sound. Let's keep this in mind. This is, uh, this picture is at the peak of the development of the food system. And what is it that we have there? We find that in the milpa, which is similar to the cultivation in Asia, 
There is a useful biodiversity of a minimum of 20 to a maximum of 50 species. The home garden, 50, 387 species. Beekeeping, uh, including uh, species that provide the nectar to the bees, both for apis and melipona genus of uh, bees, from 35 to 103 maximum species. And from the forest, they use from 50 to 248 uh, species. Forest and hunting from 8 to 18 species. So there is a great diversity and there's a great number of uh, species that the Yucatec Maya are using from these different subsystems. But let's take a look of what's going on when they reach the peak of their food system. It's not a flat line. It's a line that has different uh, changes through time. And if we set two lines showing the boundaries of uh, the development of these systems, then we find a range of dynamic equilibrium, just like Clements and Tansley uh, are talking about when they refer to forest ecosystems. Beyond the dotted lines, the system collapses. So the trick of the Yucatec Maya farming system, the food system, sorry, is to maintain these subsystems articulated uh, and getting to this point of a dynamic equilibrium. This can be considered sustainability. And what happens in this dynamic equilibrium period of time, it's domestication of new species, innovation, creation of new varieties, development of strategies for ad adaptation to changes, developing certainty in the middle of uncertainty, resource conservation, food systems are articulated with each other, etc. So this equilibrium, this dynamic equilibrium that the Yucatec Maya developed in, this, uh, in their food systems is critical for many, from many points of view. Now, if we think of a single line, behaving like this black line that I'm showing is not alone. Each subsystem contributes to the uh, sustainability of the whole system. So the dynamic equilibrium is not based on one subsystem, food production subsystem, but they, it's based on the articulation of the different subsystems that the Mayas uh, have developed through time. If one of the subsystems does not do well under certain climate conditions, others will compensate. That's the basic idea. Now, understanding how this uh, dynamic equilibrium works, we have to take into account spiritual values, cosmogony of the culture, diversified food sources, family and community development. And this goes like a cycle through time. There is some sort of feedback from each of them. So when the something happens, when especially when they adopt different ways of learning and applying different techniques in their food production system, like the Green Revolution, we start seeing a collapse of the system, breaking the boundaries of the dynamic equilibrium. The, the system is not longer resilient. And that happens when new uh, ways of learning, ways of transmitting knowledge, ways of innovating, moving from the traditional ways to do so to the conventional ways to do so, moving from the traditional knowledge to green revolution technology, explain, explains why then the system goes into uh, breaking the boundaries of resilience, and then it's no longer under a dynamic equilibrium. Under the conventional way of learning, constructing, innovating, and transmitting knowledge, we have a vertical way of decision making. We have deduction rather than induction. That system of learning does not appreciate local knowledge. We have tendency to reductionism. We have no appreciation of acknowledgement of local values. We have no acknowledgement of local varieties no connection with the community. And as a result, we have 
green revolution technologies, substituting traditional technologies. We have the introduction of GMOs. We have envi human environmental health at risk. We have a loss of biocultural diversity. We lose sustainability, livelihood, social fabric, traditional knowledge, etc. So if we are here, to many of the Yucatec Maya indigenous people in their uh, food systems, if we are here beyond the limits of the uh, dynamic equilibrium, how can we pick it up? How can we pick up the system? We can use agroecology to recover, or we can choose the new regenerative agriculture. We have to discuss this. And so what are the challenges? What are the key challenges for producing high agrobiodiversity in a traditional way? These are the questions that we have to address when we say that the food of tomorrow depends on successful indigenous food systems. Thank you. Gracias. All right, thank you very much, Francisco, for the very interesting overview. I really, I really enjoyed how you showed uh, this dynamic uh, equilibrium. It was a very interesting way to show the importance of indigenous people in conserving agrobiodiversity. So thank you once again. Now, I would like to invite uh, Gracia Dakar. Gracia is graduated from Jawaharlal Nehru University in India. Her interesting work extends uh, to integrating traditional knowledge with innovation to preserve and promote sustainable biodiversity production. Welcome, Gracia. Thank you, Ivan, and uh, thank you for giving me this time. Uh, let me allow me to share my screen. Um, so coming from a matrilineal society, uh, the deep matriarchal values of caring and sharing has helped us to live in close harmony with our ecosystem. Uh, we share the sacred relationship with nature where we, uh, you know, we respect our biodiversity and uh, the rich indigenous knowledge has guided us to use our resources sustainably. But the shifting concept of local diets and the industrialization of agriculture have made our people vulnerable. And they are made to believe that instead of biodiversity, we must depend on only a few crops to meet our needs. So we at NESPAS, we are working with our indigenous communities to change this narrative and to revitalize a local food uh, system. Uh, with the help of consultants and FCO, we have conducted like participatory mapping exercises and resilience mapping. Uh, we found that on an average, there are about 200 food plants, most of which are micronutrient rich and climate resilient, but are also the most neglected and underutilized species. Here, biodiversity was also ranked as the most resilient component. Uh, a recent study on the household food insecurity access scale uh, in, conducted in 18 villages in Northeast India showed that there is virtually a non-existent of uh, uh, severe food insecurity, which demonstrated that the indigenous food system are resilient to the shocks of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this shows that we, the indigenous people, are custodians of the diversity that have led our people to live a to be a thriving community. Through a collective and a collaborative approach, a number of community-led actions were initiated and supported. Uh, some of these platform includes, uh, these are platforms to encourage the production of biodiversity-based production and increase the consumption of these local food. Uh, these platforms, as you can see in the slides, include the Agroecology Learning Circle, which is like a creative space that is bringing together custodian farmers, youth and mothers to reflect upon the challenges and the opportunities that this food system can bring. Uh, currently, we have about 500 farmers who have joined in this initiative. Um, we have the ABD walk or the agro biodiversity walk as a tool uh, to encourage and to inculcate uh, the, the intergenerational transfer of knowledge 
uh, we have the ICDS garden and the school gardens, including the community garden as an entry point for the introduction of learning on indigenous food system to, among the school going children. This is also linked to the uh, school feeding program or the mid day meal program, which is facilitating the consumption of rich, nutritious food. Uh, the community seed bank is also emerging as a locally governed and managed institution that is promoting uh, strengthening the local seed system while also promoting seed sovereignty. Uh, the 10 community seed banks that we have supported are now conserving and propagating more than 22 local uh, crop uh, species. Uh, to introduce this local food to a greater audience, we have the Meram O Cafe or the Mother Earth Cafe and uh, value addition of these products. Uh, to, uh, as part of the movement to in, uh, in, uh, encourage the youth to participate in the indigenous food system, uh, we have organized the youth uh, indigenous youth fellowship and the 24 youth who have been trained are now engaged in uh, food-based uh, local actions. In the course of our journey, we see that there has been several positive impacts, which I've listed a few here. Uh, women have always been the seed savers in our indigenous food system. Here we have in the picture, Kong Radians Aim, who is a farmer from a village Kweng. She has successfully adapted a variety of tomato that she has exchanged from farmers from like Kanso. She's currently supporting other farmers in her community with, uh, to access the planting material. She's also sharing knowledge about the uh, crop and at the same time, encouraging farmers in her community to reduce their dependence on the market bought high yielding variety. Then we are also seeing government officials and departments beginning to acknowledge the role of the indigenous food system and we are also able to support other grassroots organizations and networking with them to scale up the agroecological practices. The other is the 40 uh, school gardens that have been uh, established, which has evolved as a space for conservation of these micronutrient rich uh, species and the underutilized uh, species of wild edibles and their inclusion in the midday meal that is uh, increasing the dietary diversity. Also, mothers and young women have taken on the role of educators uh, to disseminate the knowledge of the agrobiodiversity in the food system, as well as inculcating positive attitude towards the indigenous food system. It's thus quite evident that indigenous food system is a game changer. Supporting and improving the efficiency of this system can contribute, would address multiple sustainable development goals. But these systems are faced with uh, challenges of the current development discourse uh, and farming advances that is led by uh, e emerging eco-industry that threatens the co-optation of knowledge and the rapid loss of indigenous uh, knowledge. Also, the failure to recognize the rights of these indigenous people is a major threat to the food system. But the food system can significantly contribute to SDG if the collective and the individual rights of the indigenous people and their land are being ensured and they are actively engaged in uh, to participate in the policy making. Uh, handing over the leadership to women and farmers to self-determine uh, their response to the challenges faced by the indigenous communities is critical in transitioning to a, a sustainable and equitable uh, local food system. We are grateful to TIP and uh, FEO for the technical support and provided with fund, we will be able to do much more. And uh, because these systems are indigenous people and their food system have the capacity to generate new strength and uh, resilience. Therefore, it is time for an interconnected uh, movement to advocate for the shift towards agroecological paradigm that deepens the principles of biodiversity-based, socially just and ecological food system through uh, greater uh, collaboration, dialogues and actions. Thank you.
Yes, thank you very much, Gracia. Uh, I really, really enjoyed uh, how you showed us these different actions and how they reflect in this uh, wonderful and biodiverse agricultural system. And the photos were great, very colorful. So I, I thank you very much for, for your uh, inputs. Uh, now, I, I would like to, to bring uh, Mr. Pitakia Tikai. Mr. Tikai is speaking from Solomon Islands. Uh, he is the coordinator for, for Custom Gaiden Association, KGA, a national government, non-government uh, organization. KGA works with Solomon Islands communities to improve their food security through one, encouraging self-reliance and sustainable organic food production for family first and then for market, uh, local market, two, supporting farmers to farmer extension and networks, three, supporting family nutrition, four, provision of training and assistance in setting up and managing community-based seed, and five, conservation of indigenous staple food crops, fruits and nuts, planting material production slash distribution networks. I now call upon Mr. Tikai. Thank you, I'll share my screen. Okay, um, Custom Garden promotes collection and conservation of traditional food crops. That includes fruits and nuts from wild, and also uh, the ones that uh, we receive from the Ministry of uh, Agriculture. And uh, we also promote nutritional security. In doing so, we try to establish gene plasm centers in different islands or provinces in the country. We work with partners and in these uh, gene plasm centers, we uh, grow crops like staple crops, fruit trees and nuts, crops that are high in vitamin A, crops that are resilient to natural disasters, crops that are tolerance to pest and disease, and also late and early maturity uh, crops. Example of some of the indigenous yam varieties that we collected and bulk at in these templars and centers. These collections, when we did the collections, we also do labeling. We label all the um, uh, plasms that we collected in each of the um, centers. And then we grew them in the garden. And uh, we hold Farmers Field Day or Diversity Fair to promote the distribution of um, the planting materials. Here during the uh, diversity fairs, farmers from the surrounding communities they came and uh, evaluate the gemplasm collections. They select what is best or superior based on their own criteria, whether it's for pest and disease tolerance, or is it because of the environmental yeah, uh, factors or because of yield and so forth. And then from there, we distributed these best ones to the surrounding communities. Uh, through our local network, we call it planting material network. And some of these collections that are collected from the germplasm centers are also sent back to KGA, which we further multiply and then distributed them to the other provinces in the country. During the diversity fairs also, the uh, participants, they come and do the organoleptic test. They tested the collections and then they give scores that allow us to do the selection based on what they scored. In terms of food security or nutritional security, we also did collection of our own or our local indigenous 
leafy vegetables. I put some of the examples here, as you see, like here on my left side, the ficus species. Uh, to promote people to eat more of our local vegetables rather than going into the imported uh, vegetables or leafy vegetables. We also promoted uh, collections and also uh, introducing or introduction of uh, orange flesh bananas. Uh, these are high in um, vitamin A and also sweet potatoes. Also, we encourage farmers or people, communities to go into crop and animal interactions for agro-biodiversity and also food security. Farmers also grow yeah, food to meet their social obligations. For example, like this variety of yam, farmers use it to exchange or sell money for bright price in some of the communities in Solomon Island. Custom Garden also is providing trainings for farmers, especially on the open pollinated seed varieties so that they can save their own seeds and don't depend much on buying of seeds because here in a country so small and a lot of times it's difficulty to find seeds. We train farmers on rapid multiplication so that they can easily multiply the uh, collected germplasm uh, materials. Also, we train farmers on soil fertility improvement like crop rotations, mulching, green manure, uh, composting. All these are based on the, the ecosystem yeah, based, based approach so that our soil will be healthy. So that uh, we produce healthy crops and when people are eating healthy food or healthy crops, they can stay healthy so that we have healthy nation. Also, you can see our grove. Yeah, forestry, we encourage our farmers to do that also because fruit trees or trees um, would uh, provide a lot of nutrient pumps in the soil and also recycling of organic matters. That's an example of yeah, seed saving. We save a lot of seeds, especially open pollinated seeds that we distributed to our communities and farmers around the country. A way forward, what we are thinking of is like we need analysis for nutritional content of the local collections or the local yeah, germplasms, materials that we collected so that at least we appreciate the uh, nutritional value of our own crops so that we encourage our people to eat more of the uh, local food. And also processing and preparation of the local food to improve their taste so that uh, our children will not depend on the imported food that might look attractive, but are low in uh, nutritional value. Also, we need analysis of local ingredient to process local Fertilizers, we have, yeah, tried to introduce compost or some form of, yeah, uh, local available materials, but we need maybe research to help us to analyze the nutrient content of these local resources so that we can formulate our own, yeah, local feed or fertilizers that we can use it. And also one of the way forward would be to find markets for, indigenous food crops that we need a sustainable um, value chain. I think that's all, thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Tikai. I, I am really enjoying so far these presentations. We started uh, by talking about some agroecological principles and how it, uh, the indigenous people relate to that. Then we talked about several social actions and now we talk about genetics. It's just, it's just wonderful to see all this diversity, not, not 
in terms of agrobiodiversity, but also in terms of approaching uh, this uh, so important topic. So thanks once again. Uh, now, I would like to, to introduce you, uh, Mr. Roba Ulga Gilok. Mr. Roba is himself from a pastoralist community in Ethiopia. He's currently a PhD fellow at the Fletcher School of International Relation and Diplomacy at Tufts University, Massachusetts. Welcome, Mr. Roba. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen and um, we directly go to the video. Um,